before I start, I just want to make a couple of points. I, I um, my family comes from nothing. And you know, some of the, the message I give is sometimes a little dark. I am a, a true patriot. You know, I, the United States afforded me more opportunity than I could have ever dreamed of ever achieving. And I love my country, but what I see happening frightens the heck out of me. And I, you know, my dad's middle name is Miles and his best friend who lent us 60 grand to start a company in late 1989, was middle name was Franklin. And so when I tell you we come from nothing, we come from nothing in a one room office the size of a closet. So please keep that in mind as I go through some of this because I love my country. I'm very saddened to see what's happening. And I think this is very apropos. The US has done more to destroy itself in the last few years than any external enemy could have ever done. And I mean that in my soul. And I think that's part of the problem as we go through this. In fact, I often wonder the little boys and girls around the world that would watch TV and American TV and listen to American music and the, the things that made this country great. When I say this country, I mean the United States. Is it the same country anymore? And, and I'm not quite sure. We'll talk a little bit about that, but I think it's kind of appropriate for me to start that way. Now this slide came up a little bit goofed up. I don't know why, but that's why they called me up there. But this is a term that I have become very, very fond of. I think you can talk about things that are cultural or economic, little by little by little by little by little by little than all at once. And everyone needs instant gratification. And for most in the United States, that's not fast enough. And so they think it's a nothing. It's a nothing burger. It's a nothing burger. It's never going to happen. Look at what's happening around us, all around us, not just around the world, but at home. Little by little by little in the United States, we're reaching a a cultural whitewashing. And I think outside the world, the world doesn't look at us the same way anymore because of a lot of the things we've done, weaponizing the dollar, using coercion instead of cooperation, doing things that I think instead of clinging to the exorbitant privilege of being the world reserve currency, we are doing all we can to lose that. And when you look at this man right here, I talked a little bit about it this morning, it becomes a little eerie. This is a guy whose whole thesis is to lose the world reserve currency status. He is the chief economic advisor to the US government. And he's written a report called Dethrone King Dollar, where he advocated for this. And when Trump slapped tariffs on China, he said, great, maybe we'll lose the reserve status. That was picked up in the Washington Post. And when you think about the things we have done, weaponizing the dollar, signing an executive order to go green. These are the things that make me wonder. But, you know, as the world reserve currency, it should not be our prerogative to say you can use it and you can't. Think of it this way. We invaded Iraq 20 years ago, right? 20 years ago, we invaded them. They would tell you we did it illegally as we were looking for weapons of mass destruction. We destroyed their current, their country. We, we toppled their regime, put in a new one and Sorry, we didn't find any. And we're still there 20 years later. We're sanctioning 14 of their banks for trading with Iran to buy liquid natural gas to cool their homes in the middle of a 100 plus degree summer. Not cool. They make, uh, last year, $90 billion in oil revenue, Iraq did. And they're not even allowed to control or direct the proceeds of their oil sales. It's held at the New York Fed. They asked, hey, can we have a billion dollars just a few months ago? What do you think we said? Yeah, don't think so. So what did they do? Well, they formally said we'd love to be in BRICS. They're kicking the coalition forces out of the country. They made trading in dollars illegal. If you own a business and you trade in dollars, you will go to prison and they'll take your business. And as of January 1st, a few weeks ago, there are no green bills in any bank in Iraq. They look at us as being hypocritical and they're not the only ones, but this is a trend that is very alarming, this coercive, pattern uh, and sanctioning pattern is not something that is embraced so much anymore. I'll tell you that much. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. But, you know, think about it. The dollar is the dollar or is the world reserve currency because of the deal that Kissinger struck with the Saudi kingdom. We're going to protect you, but you're going to value oil and dollars through OPEC globally and reinvest the proceeds in treasuries. OK, so we sign an executive order to go green. The day we left Afghanistan, we had people hanging from a transport plane. The day after that, 
Saudi Arabia announces a joint military cooperation agreement with Russia. You can see little by little by little by little these things are training, changing, but why would anyone want to do, sell us their oil for a currency that is being inflated away? We're telling them we're going green and look at the proceeds that are supposed to be the, the excess, supposed to go into the bond market. How's that worked out for them, you think? So when you talk about incentivizing the world to look another way, it's happening. We're going green. We're weaponizing the dollar. We don't align ideologically with half of the world. We're bullies, destroying the currency. Bond market's very unstable. For the first time in 45 years, gold is more, less volatile, less volatile than the 10-year treasury. Look what all the banks around the world are doing. They're selling treasuries and buying gold. Since 2000, gold is appreciated by 7.8% per year annually. It's the tortoise. It's not the hare. All of us in, in cryptos and all of these things think that markets are supposed to go bang. Well, when you inject trillions of dollars into the system and keep interest rates suppressed forever, asset prices become stupid. And that's exactly what's happened. But quietly, when no one was looking, gold has outperformed the S&P at 7.8% return annually versus 7% on the S&P. It's obliterated the bond market. So these countries are saying, look, for 25 years, gold would have been the place to be. Let's sell our treasuries. We don't need them anymore, and we'll buy gold. It's happening little by little by little by little, and then all at once. And this is what you're beginning to see. You're seeing strength, strength in numbers. You got, you know, the majority of the OPEC countries, well, every one of the OPEC countries is on the Chinese Belt Road and Rail Initiative, which is right now 75% of human population in and of itself, 50% of global GDP. These countries are joining the BRICS, they're joining the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. In one year, think of the sanctions in Iran. They've joined the SCO, which is the largest regional military and financial organization on the planet. And they've joined the BRICS. They are finding safety and strength in numbers. They sell their oil to, to China for yuan and immediately convert it into gold on the Shanghai Gold Exchange. These countries are finding the run around, the work around, but they're finding strength in numbers. And when you realize that all of the OPEC countries are on the Belt Road, but the West isn't, it should be an eye opener for you. And when you see the things that have been happening subsequently, like all the countries joining BRICS. Now, now the ones in red are the ones that have now formally applied here in 2024. The ones in white are the ones who have expressed interest. And the ones in yellow are the ones who have been formally admitted. Now, when you put all of these countries together, each and every one of them, with the exception maybe of Saudi Arabia, each and every one of them, well, whatever. But you put them together, you are talking the majority of human population, the majority of global GDP, a stronger military might where two of the three largest nuclear arsenals in the world are behind it. You are finding countries that are finding not only safety in numbers, but that cooperation is better than coercion. And it's the first chance that many of these countries have ever even dreamed of, of, of breaking free from the 500 year Western hegemony domination between the United States and Europe. Now, I made a big deal about Saudi Arabia joining BRICS. I made a big deal about all of the OPEC countries, including Saudi Arabia on the Belt Road. I made a big deal a year ago in Davos when they said, yeah, we're open to taking other currencies for oil. But what UAE just did blew me away. They're the seventh largest producer of oil in the world. They are an OPEC country and they were just admitted into BRICS alongside of Saudi Arabia. They had a two week summit, a 10 day summit a few weeks ago. Uh, for the United Nations on climate control. And ironically enough, it was presided over by the head of the United, um, United Arab Emirates state-owned oil company, who told the former president of Ireland, you know, just saying we're going to go back to the caves if we do this, if we go away from fossil fuel. And the ironic part about it is three days before you had 200 delegates from countries around the world in United Arab Emirates, they made an admission that we are no longer taking dollars for oil moving forward. Now, equally as provocative, the day that the convention ended or the day after and everyone's on their way home, Putin, who hasn't left the country but once or twice in the last few years because of the Western bounty on his head, flew to the UAE flanked by four Russian MiG jets. I wonder what he had to say to them. 
Maybe you remember what happened to Gaddafi and to Hussein, we got your back, don't worry. And then he went right from there to Saudi Arabia where OPEC increased their, their uh, reduction in oil uh, production by from one to two million barrels per day. There are things going on little by little by little by little by little that the Western media doesn't tell us crap. And they're doing a horrible job of telling us what's important and what's happening around the world. They're fixated on a bunch of nonsense. And what's going to happen is that the majority of people that you all love and care about who think you're crazy for feeling the way that you do, cannot see what's coming at them and will not get out of the way of what is coming at them. When you see this happen, a major, major Western friendly oil producing country say, man, we're not gonna take dollars anymore. But hey, why not? You guys are going green anyway, right? It's getting real, it really is. And this to me is what I was talking about at the beginning, right? This bothers me more than anything because look, we could screw up the reserve currency, but if we still were the envy of the world in terms of our country, Look at what's happening, lawlessness, the border. 10 million people have entered the United States illegally. If two tenths of 1% of that were on the terror watch list, they keep telling us all the people they're catching on the terror watch list, two tenths of 1% is 20,000 people that would have malicious intent. They keep telling us that they're very scared about homegrown terror and, well, really? So when you talk about what the United States stood for, open borders, lawlessness, where this stuff goes on, the judicial system, I don't care what side of the aisle you're on. I mean, I don't think that the current administration and the previous administration have been treated equally. You have Lady Liberty blindfolded holding the scales of justice. This is what the country stood for. People, people walk hundreds and thousands of miles from Central America to get to a better life. People sail on inner tubes tied together with string from Cuba to find a better life. And they came here because of liberty, of, of justice, of equal justice, of, of, of things that made this country amazing. I don't even have to talk about the elections. One third of the country believes that the elections were not fair. One third, maybe it's more, maybe it's a half. So when you talk about all of these things, little by little by little by little by little by little, it is eroding away what the United States stands for incentivizing and solidifying these countries around the world saying, what the hell's happened to them? They're not what they used to be. And so I think it's all part of a bigger plan. Could it have been planned? Could this all have been planned? Why would they do that, right? Why, why would they do that? How about credit? Well, here's why they might do it. We have $5 trillion in assets, five, that's it. The biggest asset of the United States government, 40% is student debt. $1.6 trillion is the largest asset according to the 2022 balance sheet, and it'll be on the 2023 as well. Google it, it'll pop up. Student debt is what they call an asset. So we have roughly three and a half trillion in assets. Number two is military, military bases, planes, bombs, and number one or three is, is land. But so we're, we're in essence insolvent, right? We're almost at 130% debt to GDP. There's never been a country in history that crossed that line without defaulting or hyperinflating. A trillion seconds ago was 31,688 years ago, you guys. It's bigger than people understand. So in essence, we have 150 trillion in debt backed by 5 trillion in assets, of which 40% is student debt. We're broke and we're insolvent. We have $10 trillion in bonds coming due this year. How the hell are they gonna pay for that? I got a good idea, let's borrow it to pay the money we already borrowed. By 2031 in six years, 100% of all the tax revenue will go to pay just the interest on the debt and mandatory entitlement spending. Think about that. That means that 100% of all discretionary spending, which includes military, will have to be borrowed. Now ask yourself, how does the United States remain the world's superpower financially and militarily when 100% of everything discretionary, including the military budget, will have to be borrowed? Well, it can't, and that's the problem. And this is why I'm very fond of the term logarithmic decay. And, you know, the big problem is that people expect this to have happened already. Instant gratification isn't fast enough, but look what's happening within our borders and around the world. Little by little by little, but why would they do this? 
So we tell the world we're going green. We go around and coerce and, and, and sanction and do things that would make the world say, well, if we end up on the wrong side of them, we're done. If Klaus Schwab was right, if there is a great reset coming, how do you do it without eviscerating yourself? That being the Fed and the, and the Treasury and the government, you find a villain. You find a villain and that villain would be Xi Jinping and Putin and OPEC, they did it to us. But after all, we signed an executive order to go green. How many people even know that? When you talk about gold being the only other tier one reserve asset, this may explain why the central banks are buying gold at a level that no one has ever seen before. Over the last two years, they bought more, more gold than at any time in central bank history. And I wonder why. Not only have they repatriated it from the, from the hubs like the Bank of England and the, and, the, and the New York Fed, but they're massively accumulating it. Now, if you just watch the Western media, you wouldn't know that. And I think that's part of the problem is that we are being misinformed about what is really very, very important. And I hope I'm wrong. I really do. I have three children. My youngest is 16 years old. And as a father, I'm, I'm, I'm terrified at the world that they are growing up in. But ask yourself, in six years. Now, those numbers that the Congressional Budget Office put out saying by 2031, everything will need to be borrowed other than, you know, everything that, that is not... Um, um, either the interest on the debt or mandatory entitlement spendings, that doesn't even take into account the 10 million people who have entered our country and who's gonna pay for the, the medical, the schooling, um, the housing, where's all this come from? So when you talk about a problem that this country has and at the same time, all of the countries around the world are shedding our treasuries and buying gold, which has outperformed the treasury market and the stock market for the last 25 years. Years. So who's buying all the bonds? Oh yeah, that's us. That's the hedge funds. That's all of us chasing yield, right? And it's much easier to default on us than it is the rest of the world. And I think that's something to keep in mind because, you know, the central banks know the playbook, right? And they're buying it in unlimited quantities, quietly, using the suppression of the Western paper market to do that. Now you might ask yourself, well, how do they do that? Just so you understand how they do that. I have five, let's say I have 5,000 ounces of gold in my warehouse, I have to hedge it. I have to hedge it so that if the price drops by 100 bucks, I'd be out a half a million dollars. Instead, I will hedge it so that I'll sell on paper. So if it goes down 100, I'm down 500,000 in my inventory, I'm up 500,000 on my Comex account. So I'm always market neutral. It costs me 7,500 bucks or so in my margin account to control a COMEX gold contract of 220,000. It's about 35 times leverage. So what if I have 500 million in my margin account? I control 15 billion in, in derivatives. And if you look at all of the, let's use silver as an example. Right now on COMEX, silver is rehypothecated 1500%, meaning there's 1500% more paper contracts than there are bars behind it. They control the price. It's the Futures market controlling the price of the commodity. It's the tail wagging the dog. Well, this is why the world is not bitching because they're like, well, we'll beat them at their own game. They're stupid enough to do this. We will use the suppression of the Western market to gobble everything up. The last day of the year in 2023 in Shanghai, the price of silver was $2.30 an ounce more than it was on the LBMA, which is in London or the COMEX. 230, 10%. Gold was about 100 bucks higher most of the year in Shanghai. They're slowly turning up the heat, arbitraging it all away, little by little by little by little. We're losing the Western hegemony, little by little. Not gonna happen for a while, maybe. I don't know, I don't know when it is, but I do know that the world is rapidly creeping towards de-dollarization, and that is, that is, I think, impossible to refute. And how it all ends, I don't know, but I will leave you with, with this thought. Where are we on this chart? This is the Niagara Falls, and most people don't even know that the falls are coming. But whether you're talking about the social and moral decay in this country, um, or the way that we're viewed around the world, or the way that we've mismanaged the world reserve currency, little by little by little, then phew. Now, hopefully we're not anywhere near there, but I don't know. Are we there or are we there? I'll leave that up to all of you to decide. I am amazed that I actually got through this with 20 seconds left to spare because 
normally I don't do things in, that are this short, but I, I appreciate your time. And, um, and let's just simply say, I really do hope I'm wrong in all of this, but I'm beginning to feel more and more and more on an accelerated basis that I'm not. I wish you all the very best. Thank you.